Welcome to Free Media, Free Minds, a program where we discuss issues pertaining to media and uh, media freedom in South Africa. Well, today we have a look at the sustainability of uh, community media and we look at its uh, challenges, the legislative, financial and institutional challenges it faces. It's my pleasure to welcome our guests. Uh, we are of course joined in studio by Martin Jansen of Workers World Media Productions as well as CTV. We also have Rushne Ali of Radio 786 and Farid Sayed of Muslim Views. Welcome to you all. Uh, before we get to the discussion, we take a look at an insert on the topic. Community media, the biggest challenge is financial sustainability for stations. Um, that's both television as well as radio. Um, that becomes the biggest problem and that actually impacts on its operations and its effectiveness. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have money, then it's very difficult to actually do outreach activities and so on. So that becomes the biggest problem for me. Um, the second problem is um, um, like the environment, the en uh, enabling environment can be improved and it can become a challenge for community broadcasters again impacting on the finances again um, and the financial sustainability. For example, if you look at Centec and you look at both radio and television, we pay large amounts um, for transmission cost to the to Centic and that is part of the environment that we use. So um, if that cost for instance, if government can intervene and legislate community broadcasting in such a way that we pay minimal fees, then um, it can assist with um, the sustainability of the station. So those are two of the problems. Uh, another problem um, or challenge that, that community broadcasters face is actually volunteers. Not the problem so much. I think volunteers add adds a lot um, to um, the quality of programming and broadcasting. Um, but I think it does become a problem when volunteers um, are unemployed and they uh, their families put pressure on them. What we need to do now that broadcasting in terms of community radio and television is, has been in existence for 15 years, um, for radio and longer, and for TV um, for a shorter while, I think we need to review existing legislation. We need to review if the environment are actually enabling for community broadcasting to grow. Um, and for me, that includes every aspect, Centec being one, the whole question of royalties to Samro um, being another one, because remember Samro was um, the laws, the legislation that governed Samro was actually written in 1976 and currently today we're still using that same legislation so we're being charged royalties for that while we promote a lot of local artists. The government, whether it's DOC, probably the Department of Communication, needs to consider an annual grant to community broadcasters because um, at the moment we um, part of that enabling environment I spoke about earlier is actually the advertising industry we rely on advertising income to actually sustain the station but um, only a small part of that money actually goes to community broadcasters while the rest of the money goes to commercial and public so um, for me a grant would be one thing, and it can be a standardized grant um, across board. And then if stations raise income via advertising, then that support and supplement um, the money they've already um, raised. Um, it can, for instance, be a grant that looks at covering main costs, like may, uh, a few staff. Um, it can look at transmission costs can look at your rent and can look at maybe um, communication, so your telephone and so on. And I think if those basics are covered, then it can really help um, the operations and the sustainability of community broadcasters.
and that uh, Brenda Bush Radio making very important points there. I see uh, Rishni Ali will navigate you. Of course, now it's all about uh, in broadcasting. Just uh, is community broadcasting media sustainable? Can it be sustainable? We've known, uh, or rather Brenda has spoken about the challenges that they are facing at Bush Radio. Mm. Just a comment from your side where that is concerned. Um, it is sustainable when there's partners in place and that kind of support. The example that you made about the grant, um, for me, uh, another solution could possibly be that um, the industry must become more united. If community media is sold, um, in, in particular in radio, if we are sold as one sector when everybody comes together, then we have a higher impact. So those are so also certain some of the challenges. Um, but, but yes, there are lots of opportunity. Um, financial sustainability is the biggest problem. I'm going to agree with Brenda there. It's, it, it impacts on um, capacity, mm -hmm. your re resources, um, and your basically ability to deliver on what is expected of you as a community broadcaster. Yeah, Martin, from your side, uh, Workers World Media Productions as well as CTV, those major challenges uh, where television also is concerned. Look, I think as the insert has indicated, it's extremely difficult. It is possible. Uh, in the case of television, it's even more expensive and more challenging to run. Just to give you a concrete example, the transmission fees that CTV pays to Centec is approximately 70,000 Rand a month. Now that amounts to well over a million uh, you know, every year. Now just imagine, firstly, the difficulty that we have in just getting 70,000 Rand a month for transmission, which is not really concrete uh, you know it's not it's just airwaves that are being transmitted yeah. to allow the viewers to access the TV channel um, but just imagine if we had 70,000 for programming you know where we could actually enable communities through training and equipment to produce their own programs how that would enhance the quality of CTV's um, programming so that's just a, a very concrete example so in fact at the moment CTV is in a bit of trouble financially because of precisely because of the Centec fee. Mm. It doesn't have um, constant income. Advertisers are not necessarily attracted to community TV at the moment. So much of what it has from the MDDA mainly is spent on transmission fees and of course staffing costs. Yeah. So it's CTV at the moment, community TV, I would say is almost unsustainable um, in South Africa. It's very similar with radio, although the costs are probably a bit less. Mm. But the main thing is that if you operating within a poor community, then it becomes extremely difficult and you're forced into compromises um, that undermines your community mandate and community broadcasting. Yeah. Martin, who decides on uh, the charges for, for Centec that you have to pay on a, a monthly basis? Well, Centec is a parastatal company and uh, it decides on the fees and it's guided by the Department of Communications. The terrible thing is that in legislation, I think it's the Electronic Communications Act, there is provision made for differentiation in uh, transmission fees between commercial, public and community. Yeah. But Centec has never actually implemented that. So community broadcasters pay almost exactly the same as commercial broadcasters and public. And of course, they're very, very different. So we would pay the same as uh, ETV, for example, uh, where we don't have the kind of capital layout and uh, income through advertising like ETV. Mm, well, that doesn't sound really very logical where, where that is concerned. I mean, you, you have your challenges and uh, you, as you said, uh, the advertisers don't really come to community TV. But we'll get back to you, Farid, your challenges uh, uh, from the print media. Yeah, uh, Shanaz, it's slightly different to the challenges that are faced uh, by uh, television and radio. Um, you know, uh, Brenda and Martin spoke about the uh, transmission costs. Uh, our major cost is of course printing um, and printers are all commercial. The, you know, there is no 
community-funded printing press. Uh, there's no government printing press, so we don't even have the leeway of saying, you know, give us differential rates. Uh, everyone is out there to make a profit, yeah. and it you know, depends on how we negotiate with the various uh, printers, with the commercial printers. So that's our major cost, and uh, there's very little room uh, for negotiation because uh, they are also governed by fixed cost in terms of paper and labor. But I think, you know, the, the broader question about whether community media is sustainable, uh, there are various factors that impact uh, uh, on community media and its sustainability. There are the internal and external factors, and I think the major one is funding. Uh, community media, and I can speak here for print media, established by vibrant people, very excited, uh, yeah. very much of an activist spirit, uh, but they often have very little capital to, to start off. And, but I think the, the major impact is the advertising revenue. We are competing against the media conglomerates. We are competing against well-resourced institutions. And uh, because we target a particular market, and that market is one that uh, has very, it's, it's not really penetrated by big media. For example, the rural communities, and I'm not just speaking about Muslim views. Uh, there's, you know, the the uh, communities where there's very little access uh, in terms of newspapers. The advertisers just look at that and they say, "Look, that's not our market. That's not the LSM that we are aiming mm -hmm. for." So uh, I think the, the mindset has to change uh, on the side of the advertisers as well, and that that's a, a huge challenge that we face. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, Rishni, um, you know where we look at uh, sustainability, especially where staff is concerned. Um, I know that uh, you know where commu community media is concerned. We've find that uh, they are normally headhunted by commercial and that is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, can you expand on that? Yes. High turnover of staff. Mm. Um, obviously also from a community media perspective is that the amount of um, the amount that you put in to have the person trained to build up somebody that would be able to do what is expected for them within their, in their role and obviously because of the funding that's a problem, you are unable to offer them salaries that compares to that of other institutions or commercial institutions. So that is actually a challenge because the person is, is at the point where you're happy to say that, that the person have been developed, they've been empowered, they've got certain skills and expertise, and then they are given an offer from a commercial media, which I mean, we can't also expect for them to turn down. People have to, to earn a, a, an income and make a living. So those, and there's quite a um, large number of um, high turnover of staff at community media institutions, particularly in radio. And then you always find that there's this gap now because it's, a, it's about having to retrain people. Mm. So we always seem to be lagging behind building up new relationships, um, and which is a huge, huge challenge. Yeah, Martin, uh, from your side also, um, you know, where training is concerned, we do know that uh, CTV also um, offers training to perhaps video journalists uh, uh, really using the, uh, like a cell phone and all of that and, and how to uh, report, you know, to report a story, etc. Um, where training is concerned, uh, how do you find that uh, where CTV is concerned? Uh, do you find also a high turnover in stock? Um, perhaps not for, yes, but perhaps not for the same reason. Um, I think CTV does manage to access limited funds for doing training, um, but I know in the, in the radio sector it's as if the community broadcasting sector is a training ground, a recruitment ground for the commercial and public broadcaster. Uh, and that, that's a big problem. And the fact that the community broadcasters don't get compensated mm. for that is a big problem. Now, interestingly, FIFA seems to have solved that problem in relation to professional football. I think a year or two ago, FIFA introduced a regulation where the bigger clubs, you know, like your big professional clubs, Man United and Barcelona and so on, if they recruit from amateur clubs or lower league clubs, um, they can't just expect to pay a certain fee and then poach the player. They need to compensate the junior club and the amateur club of that player for training the player to get to that level where they can now play professional football. And it's a significant amount of money. And perhaps something like that should be introduced in the broadcasting and media sector as well. 
because it's a huge loss. You know, training costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time, resources. It's a big investment for community broadcasters, and then they just get poached uh, by the SABC and commercial broadcasters. So I think something like that needs to be devised. Indeed, uh, uh, Rishni, we, we that is concerned. I mean, do, uh, even we comed uh, community media or broadcasting is concerned. I mean, d even the uh, the the culture of uh, sharing of information and and training mm -hmm. happens. But do you find that from commercial side, they perhaps uh, we just listen to what Martin has said about commercial should be able to pay, you know, or give something towards uh, community. Um, do you find that they trying to make it up by having workshops for community? radio stations <laughs> or community <laughs> media for that matter sure, yes they do and they call it social responsibility <laughs> now but I, I agree with Martin there should be something in place because we did invest as a community broadcaster there was a lot of investment um, I think also it's the commercials also taking advantage of the fact that um, at community media le level even though it's regarded as a, as a training ground it's, we also see it as an opportunity to empower our people, people that didn't have access to, 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 to electronic media. So um, we, we, we freely then um, get people involved so that you could teach them those kinds of skills and get them at that level. Um, you ha we have, for example, tried when we speak to other media as well, um, we have tried to put contracts in place and say to them, but hang on, even when you're at the commercial station, come back and train and give. And, and practicality doesn't always work that. So maybe it is something that should be enforced by uh, the, um, an institution like the Department of Communications or ICASA yeah. to ensure that there is always follow through and that we are in a position as community broadcasters to be able to train more. Yes, indeed. This is uh, Free Media, Free Minds. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Free Media, Free Minds. We continue our discussion on community media sustainability. We're looking at, we also said we're going to look at legislative challenges, Martin. Um, Brenda, in an insert, mentioned um, the Act of 1994. That's not really, uh, she feels, uh, not really relevant or not really uh, good for community broadcasters at this point in time. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I think the Electronic Communications Act does make provision for three tiers of broadcasting and for rates, for example, from Centec for the transmission cost. The problem is it hasn't been implemented. So it needs a review to make it more specific okay. so that it can say that community media uh, or broadcasting should either not be charged or charge the very, very low rate that's affordable. So I think more than reflecting on the existing legislation, I think there are lots of shortcomings and we need new legislation to give meaning to all the requirements and issues that we're raising uh, in this discussion. Now last year the minister did uh, put forward a number of bills uh, around broadcasting, uh, public and community. Uh, there were a few problems in them. Uh, I don't know if I should go into them. But relating to broadcasting and sustainability, there was provision for probably both the SABC and community broadcasting that there should be a 1% levy or tax uh, on the citizenry uh, to, include, to increase the revenue of the state to enable a fuller subsidy of the SABC. And I think we had all hoped also for community broadcasters. Mm -hmm. Now, there were lots of responses to that. I think several organizations, like ourselves, responded positively to that. We thought it was a good step in the right direction. Unfortunately, since then, the, the proposed bill or the legislation has been withdrawn. We're not sure what the status is at the moment, but we certainly think that that discussion should be revived, um, mm -hmm. particularly around a broadcasting fund to ensure sustainability of, as I said, the SABC and community broadcasters. 
What form that could take, uh, we can mm. obviously discuss, yeah. but it's necessary. Yeah, Rushi, we always uh, speak about, you know, when um, uh, Brenda also mentioned about uh, government uh, giving a grant towards uh, community broadcasters, etc. But uh, community broadcasters are always wary of, you know, what else comes with that, with that yes. funding. Yes. Um, uh, what do you think of that? I, I was going to just add on to that because part of the challenges of, of why some, in some coaches, the bill was also. Um, um, there was a resistance against it, was that in community media uh, um, broadcasters I instance, they suggested that community that must be taken in by the municipalities in, in the area in which they're broadcasting, which obviously raised huge uh, problems because what does that mean for how how accountable you want to keep that uh, uh, municipality when it comes to service delivery? Are you going to be restricted in the kind of programs that you now have to um, uh, um, broadcast. broadcast? And so it was a, a lot of those challenges. Uh, the other concern was also um, that uh, community broadcasters were also expected to pay of its revenue towards this fund. And in principle, the, the fund was a good idea. What we, also, what we had a problem with is we are the ones that are struggling and we are expected to pay to the fund. Mm -hmm. Though we're not saying it should be all for free, we did feel that at some point the commercial um, media broadcasters should have a, 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 a bigger contribu contribution to that fund because ultimately they are also the ones that benefit from whatever mm. that takes um, place at the community broadcaster level. So there were lots of those kinds of challenges. Um, the, the biggest concern was just the restriction around when they said that they wanted to introduce um, part of the suggestions were, were for um, financial sustainability, were how is it going to impact on the community broadcasters um, independence in terms of his programming and how mm. he delivers on what the uh, provincial, local or municipality is doing within that mm. area. Yeah, of course, uh, touching on the public broadcasting bill as well. Uh, Farid, from your side, where print media is concerned, legislation, uh, how does it affect uh, print media? Well, you know, uh, again, it's a different set uh, of uh, legislation that would impact on print media. But I think more broadly, you know, and, and uh, we're looking at it right now, it's the secrecy bill. Uh, mm. That impacts hugely on print media, a as it does on uh, other sectors of the media. But I think in, in the case of print media, we, we found that there, uh, there's legislation, for example, the Labor Relations Act. Uh, there's the, the, the BE uh, component, for example. Uh, those are, you know, for small uh, enterprises, it places huge pressure. Uh, the training, for example, is not taken into account. And just coming back on, on, on that, uh, for example, the we do the coaching and the, they do the poaching. You know, <laughs> that is how I would yeah. normally look at it. You know, yeah. uh, and and the media conglomerates uh, do have a fund, and they contribute, for example, to the MDDA, and then we have Print Media South Africa (PMSA), uh, which has a fund as well. But that money does not come to uh, community media. It doesn't come down to them. Uh, it's not pumped into uh, training. Uh, it's really to pay staff uh, that are supposed to conduct workshops, mm. etc. So we haven't really seen that uh, filtering through to community media. But as for getting back to the question of legislation, uh, the, the, the biggest really uh, challenge to uh, print media at the moment is the uh, information bill. You know, if, yeah. if we don't win that fight, uh, I think it's going to be uh, a, a, it can have a crippling effect on uh, print media. And I'll give you an example. Um, the predecessor of Muslim uh, views was Muslim News, and I'm talking of the 80s. But again, you know, because of government pressure, uh, we, we did an expose on bribery by a government agency during the time of apartheid. And we were sued for something like 2.5 million rands now for a community uh, publication. And that was in the 80s? That was in the 80s. Wow. You know. That was a lot and of money. And within a few months of that uh, legal action, the newspaper had to shut down. There are those dangers as well. You know, it comes in a different form. But again, the pressure of legislation on uh, media as such 
uh, can have a crippling effect. Yeah. Uh, coming back to you, the secrecy bill, of course, the public mm -hmm. uh, broadcasting bill as well. Rishin, you've touched on it where you said that uh, the broadcaster, especially where radio is concerned, we will be given a you know a, a, a place to broadcast from from the municipality, etc. And and you know we will be uh, legislated or controlled in that way. Where television is concerned, how will this uh, public broadcasting bill affect uh, television, Martin? Well, I think it's very similar. Uh, I think it doesn't specifically refer to community radio. It refers to community broadcasters. Mm. And yeah, Roshni is correct. It did make provision for building closer relations with municipalities and getting some resources from them. But the worry and the fear was that if it's legislated in that kind of way, it would affect our independence and programming, especially in situations where community broadcasters have very, very weak institutional arrangements mm -hmm. in terms of control, organization, structures, and the relations with their communities, and obviously policies around independence. So we objected heavily to that. And as I said, much of that has been withdrawn now, and it's back to the drawing board for the ministry. So we don't know what's going to come uh, in the near future. Um, look, I think there the, the are solutions um, yeah. which does involve state support. I don't think we can avoid that. The role of the state is there to distribute the resources to where it's needed most. And in this case, if it's community broadcasting, then I think the municipality does have a role to play. But it, the legislation must be very clear that it's not in a sort of sweetheart relationship. It must be completely independent. So our view is that there should be legislation which allocates either a certain proportion of the municipality's budget or makes provision as part of, let's say, um, water bills or rates and that kind of thing, um, where there's a levy of even uh, as little as 10 or 20 rand a year, which is quite affordable to most communities. Uh, that will go a long way to you know, creating sustainability mm. for community broadcasters. And I know that in the case of CTV, we are approaching the city of Cape Town with this idea of a municipal levy once or twice a year, um, which won't impact on communities uh, in, in a heavy way and will provide a much, much better service to the community. Mm. Mm. Okay, Roshni, if we could I get a quick yeah. remark from okay, you, please. I just wanted to add on to that. I think it also speaks about um, for communities to take ownership of community broadcasters. That, that for me, is also very important. There's not enough um, ownership on the part of um, communities that not just from a programming perspective but also when it comes to the financial or the capacity or the human resources of the of the community broadcaster okay for it from your side yeah you know just going back to the question of uh, legislation you know i think you know it's more a lack of empowering legislation that uh, impacts on the sustainability of community media and I, i'm talking here again with print media for example uh, advertisers you know it's so easy for them to move the business away uh, rates are offered uh, cut price rates by uh, huge media concerns and we we had an example we had a publication and in uh, a sister publication and uh, we survived for about six months before the uh, conglomerates came in and just started slashing advertising and I think if there's legislation and I, I know I'm talking of state control but I agree with uh, Martin uh, we do need state intervention uh, if community media is to survive. And so I would say, you know, we are looking at the one side, uh, the type of legislation that has a negative yeah. impact, but I think there is room and there's scope for legislation that will have an empowering impact on Thank you so media. much. And uh, that's where we conclude our discussion uh, for uh, this uh, show, clearly showing that indeed a balance must be uh, uh, achieved where government and community broadcasting uh, is concerned. Uh, thank you to our studio guests. Uh, uh, this program was brought to you by the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, the Alternative Information and Development Centre in collaboration with Cape Town Community TV. I have studied the idea of a democratic 